Hello colleagues, I'm Colin Simpson from Teleadvisors and welcome to our April webinar. Today we're going to be looking at some different facets of uh, professional learning and professional development in higher education institutions. Uh, Dr Keith Heger is a lecturer in learning design at the University of Technology, Sydney. In the past, he's been a professional officer and organiser in an educational union, a uh, corporate trainer, a learning designer, and also a teacher and school leader in public and independent schools in Australia and the UK. He's a Google certified teacher, an Apple distinguished editor, ed educator, and an Adobe campus leader. His research interests include learning design, technology enhanced learning, civics and citizenship education and social movements. So certainly in the right place. Um, over to you. Thanks Colin and uh, hello everyone um, and uh, good afternoon uh, to you all. I'm, I'm coming to you um, from Darug land in, in Penrith in New South Wales where it is very wet and miserable. Um, so I'd just like to start off by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land. Uh, on which I guess we're all digitally meeting. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess um, I'd also like to say thank you to, to everyone from the, the Teleadvisors community. Uh, I'm reasonably new to the group and, and I feel like I've been really made to feel welcome, um, which is nice. And what I was just going to say, just while we're doing the transition and the swap over, um, I notice a lot of you are, are big on Twitter and, and I've tried to follow as, I've met as many of you as I can. But have you all seen Bookcase Credibility? Um, so this is a Twitter account that goes around and rates the, the bookcases and people's backgrounds for Zoom meetings and things like that. It's, it's quite amusing. And I'm just conscious that I don't have any bookcases at all in my background. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I do have bookcases in this room. You just can't see them. Uh, I'm just glad you can't see all the kids' toys everywhere as well. Um, so I, I kind of reached out to, um, to Colin maybe late last year, early this year. Um, and said, listen, I, I want to, you know, have a chat to the community about uh, this this new role that I've picked up. Uh, and he said, well, why don't you do a webinar on it? And and I said, oh, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity, and I'll jump right into it. Um, and then I saw a couple of the other webinars and thought, no, I'm way out of my depth here. But Colin talked me into it. Um, and so this is what I'm going to spend maybe the next 20 minutes um, uh, talking about. What, what we're doing here and, and, and you know, really I want to have a conversation with you and, I, and more than just the next 25 minutes, I want to keep the conversation going. Um, I want to hear your ideas uh, and, and just like uh, Professor Reedman was talking about, I really hope that we can, um, you know, share some, some cross-institutional best practices and possibilities and ideas and all those kinds of things. Oh, Hank, I hear you about the gifts. I miss the gifts too. Um, I was going to start off with something cool like this. So just in the chat window, make sure you're all still awake and alive. Put A if you're working as an academic. Put L if you're working as a learning or instructional designer. And put O if you're doing something entirely different and other. Just so I can get a bit of a, a flavour for who's in the room. Okay. All right. So so mostly, uh, I like, the, you know, there's always people who, who muck around with it, you know, and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm both. I'm learning and something else. And that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, you're a talented individual. A L O, <laughs> fantastic. All right. Um, yeah. And uh, Stephen, I know that you you've got a lot of hats on. Uh, Chris, you're a lol. I like it. All right. Um, so this is me. We've already done all that kind of stuff. The introduction. That's fine. Um, I should have put on there. I'm a fellow of the Royal Society for the Arts as well, because I'm quite proud of that one. And that's me on Twitter at Keith Haggard. If you want to follow me, you're more than welcome to do that. And that's my email address. But what I really want to get into. Um, is talking about this new proposed graduate certificate in learning design that we're thinking of offering at, at um, UTS. Um, but before I do that, I've got to do my proviso and say that this is entirely a draft um, meeting. Uh, well, you know, my, my suggestion is entirely a draft because um, it hasn't even been through the courses accreditation committee or the academic board. Um, you know, that I am discovering a whole new appreciation just for the amount of bureaucratic red tape there is involved in developing a whole new course at a university. Um, so we've been through about five different committees and, and the next one is the course accreditation committee. So I'm going to duck out of here. Well, it's actually at about 1.30. I've got my, my uh, meeting with the course accreditation committee. I hope they're going to be gentle with me. Um, yeah, but, but everything I'm going to talk to you about here is entirely draft and, and I'd ask you to, to treat it like that. Um, so I guess I should start off by saying 
why is the fir why why do we need a new uh, qualification for learning designers? Why do we need a qualification for learning designers at all? Uh, and and I think um, Professor Reedman's talk kind of suggested that there may be a bit of institutional level interest uh, in this kind of qualification in learning and teaching. And and well while, while Professor Reedman was talking mostly about learning and teaching, I, I think I think there is a slight change of focus when we start talking about learning design. Um, you might have seen these headlines. I, you know, I love to collect a good headline. Uh, and you might have seen that that one from, I think, I can't remember where that was from. Um, but, you know, this notion that the hottest job in higher education is the instructional designer. Um, you know, I, I'm a lecturer at UTS and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot more jobs and they're a lot better paid than, um, than as instructional designers or learning designers in higher education institutions are as, as entry level education. Uh, entry-level lecturers. Um, there's also this idea that academics need to start spending a bit of time thinking about Plan B, um, which is interesting. Yeah, I, I don't particularly like the Sherpa. It's an interesting idea, but it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable too. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and Stephen, you're saying I can see the need for an academic. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not just a higher education interest in, in learning design. And that's the, the first point that I really want to make. The, the course that we're developing is much broader than just a, um, a qualification for higher educational lecturers. Um, it, it is something that there's an interest in in a corporate sense, you know. So in the top left hand corner there, you know, you've got a director learning design. That's a senior public um, public service position. Uh, you know, I think they're talking about having a team of 50 learning designers working for Transport New South Wales, which would just be extraordinary. Um, the financial insurance sector is big into this notion of learning design and especially alongside it, user experience design. Uh, so you can see Alliance Australia is recruiting there. And my personal favourite, learning and development manager at Guzman and Gomez, which is often um, very much related to the notion of learning design. Oh, Sandra, I'm so glad you said that. That is, you know, that is one of the, the, the big issues in in this field. Uh, and I think it is, it's part of a broader field because I, I'm sure you've had those kind of conversations where you say to people, well, I'm a learning designer. And they, they say to you, well, what's that then? Uh, or they say, oh, well, you're a teacher then. And you say, well, no, not exactly. And and uh, that, that lack of clarity about what we are and who we are and what we do, I think is, is central. Um, to to this kind of discussion that I'm hoping to, to get started. Um, it, it's also a rapidly growing field uh, across all the sectors of education. You might think that there might be no application for learning designers in a primary school, but I, I was talking to a, a very um, a very exclusive primary school in, in Sydney not so long ago, and they're about to employ three learning designers. Um, you know, not not classroom teachers and, and not technology specialists, but learning designers. Um, it, but it but it is you know that that kind of definitional confusion hasn't really stopped um, the interest in it. I mean, <laughs> one of the job adverts that I didn't put up there um, was a, a job advertisement for Lion Nathan, the big brewing company, uh, and they were trying to recruit um, five learning designers. You, you can guarantee that I, I check that one out. Um, of course, I think they're actually looking for more. Um, oh well, I would call them full stack programmers, but uh, they, they were using the language of learning design. Um, you know, they're talking about fifteen percent growth in Australia over the next couple of years, um, and that was before the, this pandemic, which is probably um, going to change the, the kinds of things um, about how we 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 are approaching how how we are seen. Um, so, you know, I, I did a bit of a, a quick thumbnail sketch um, to try to have a look at, you know, what does it actually mean to, to, to these these jobs? What are they looking for? And you can see that it's, it's a pretty broad scope. But one of the central things right in the middle there is most of them really want high level interpersonal and communication skills, which is something that's often overlooked, as well as you might imagine the design element of educational programs. Um, I'm not going to muck around too much on that. Um, I've also engaged in some pretty high level consultations with all kinds of people. And, and you see Stephen Colber is there in the education sector uh, and Stephen's in the chat um, and he's he's uh, um, spoken 
uh, with me about um, what he thinks a, a learning designer and instructional designer should be. I've gone international. So Anne Marcus Quinn, who who is um, a course director from the University of Limerick, I had a fantastic discussion with her. And of course, within Australia, you've got people like Laurie Lockyer and Peter Goodyear, and you know an incredible depth of of knowledge about learning design, instructional design, and all of those kinds of things. Um, I also spoke to a lot of industry people, you know, so what does Apple think learning design looks like? What does Adobe think learning design looks like? Um, and once you separate their their technology from their pedagogy, if, if that's possible, it's, it's actually really quite interesting. And, and naturally enough, I spoke to lots of people who are working as learning designers about the kinds of things that they think um, they need to know and, and they um, need to be able to do. Uh, okay. Um, so taking that kind of consultation, um, I developed this, this list of very brief considerations and, and I'm conscious that um, time is short. So I'm just going to race through them really quickly and then get onto you onto you know, the, this course that we've developed. Um, the most important one is that there are significant time constraints in people seeking to be upskilled or credentialed as learning design. Um, you know, it, it probably surprises no one that we're looking at mostly part time study. Uh, people fitting it around other careers or other study. Um, there's geographical availability as well. Um, while many le learning designers have embraced the role because it allows them a degree of freedom in where they work, um, we need to be mindful of that because it might not mean that they can attend face-to-face -face classes. Um, workload means that there are real challenges around cost and about the amount of people that want to take on. Um, you know, so I think that speaks towards exactly what uh, Professor Reedman was saying about um, credentials and micro-credentials and short courses in particular. Um, there are specific sectoral challenges as well. Um, you know, so, so a learning designer in a higher education institution might be a very different role from a learning designer in a corporate setting compared to a learning designer in a primary school, compared to a learning designer in an entrepreneurship or a startup or something like that. Um, and, and yeah, that's related to the contextual factors factors as well. Um, I can see all these brilliant questions coming up um, uh, and, and I will get to some of them when I get a chance. Um, so what kind of people would be interested in such a qualification? Um, the first people that come to mind are, you know, those up and coming educational leaders. We know a lot of people um, see uh, proficiency in technology enhanced learning as being a, a gateway to um, for the career progressions, especially within the education sectors. Um, but the, then on the other side of the thing, you have that, that casual teacher who just can't break into uh, a permanent gig. And then an additional qualification might very well offer them that role. Um, and then there's the one that I was calling the interested teacher, the teacher who's been teaching for 20 years and is looking to upskill uh, and develop some of those things. Um, and, and all my friends said, no, Keith, you mean the tired teacher, the teacher who's potentially looking for something a little bit different um, and perhaps something that they can work around parental commitments or something like There's the corporate trainer um, who may be interested in, in learning design and moving online and those kinds of things. Um, there's the worst word, maybe the second word, worst word in the English language, um, the edupreneurs. I, I, I hate the term. Uh, but there's no doubt there is a lot of interest around educational technology uh, and development of particular tools, resources, apps, you name it. Um, and, and it might very well help them to have some kind of background and understanding about education. Moist, Lisa. I think everyone agrees on moist being the worst word in the English language. Um, PhD students and academics seeking seeking a role, something more permanent, um, you know, or, or perhaps moving out of uh, academia and into supporting academia. And of course, there's the, the ones that have fallen into the role um, of learning designers. And that's a really interesting point because um, we, we've got a couple of units who, who employ learning designers at UTS. Um, and despite how many times they advertise, it's often really hard to appoint people. And often when you get these people in positions who are suitable, they come from a diversity of backgrounds. So, so, for example, you know, we have got a fantastic learning designer who comes from an architecture background. Um, we have some who come from teaching backgrounds. We have some who come from programming and computers and, and that kind of technology backgrounds. But there doesn't seem to be a commonality of experience. Um, and unfortunately, that means that there's a, a significant variance in the kind of things that they can provide to the people that they're working with. Um, so perhaps this little bit of paper might add some level of standardization without constricting their particular skills and abilities. Um, you know, so this is a, a little bit of journey 
mapping that we were talking about. Uh, and the key thing here for us was, um, yeah, so Tom, you, you're perfect. You fell into it, didn't you? <laughs> um, so uh, a key thing for us here would be this notion that um, you, you can have a bite-sized choice. You can you can't do a little bit of something and see if you like it and then move on. Um, and, and I know that's not particularly revolutionary or new at all. Um, so uh, it, it is a strength, hint. Absolutely. I, I agree it's a strength, but it's also, uh, you know, something to build on rather than build around. Um, so some of the challenges that I was facing within the course was the, the need to match um, experience uh, versus expertise. You know, I really didn't want this new new course at UTS to turn into, hey, and this is how we use Articulate Storyline or Blackboard Ultra or whatever, okay? Because the reality is in five years time, we're probably not gonna be using those tools. So it's not a matter about exp expertise in any one subject, but equally it's important to have as broad an experience of different kind of tools and, and environments and, and you know, strategies um, as possible. Because that way, when people go into industry, wherever that may be, they'll be much, much more um, prepared for it. Uh, the other challenge that we're gonna face is the, the, the level of technical versus theoretical knowledge. Um, you know, so one of the things um, I'm conscious of is that a lot of these learning design programs, and especially the instructional design programs in the, the US, um, there's a lot of criticism that they're just too theory based, you know, oh, I learn everything I need to know about theory, but I never actually did anything. Um, the other thing is there's going to be a range of learner experiences to this point. Um, people are going to be uh, coming straight out of the classroom, 20 years of teaching experience, and some people won't have been in a classroom for 20 years. Uh, and then the other thing that I mentioned about how um, the, the, there's a requirement for those hard technology enhanced learning skills and also those soft skills of being able to communicate, to work with, to give and receive feedback um, and that kind of thing. So some of the possible features we're thinking about here, you know, um, we want to make all of the assessment tasks portfolio items. Uh, so that when learning designers finish this course, they can show directly to potential employers, here is something that I've done. Um, and I think we're we're having big fights over the kind that we're going to use for that portfolio. Um, the other thing, and I, I'm a terrible, you know, that's the important thing, but I'm a home brewer uh, at home. And, and one of the things I talk about in home brew is this idea of an expression session. Um, so we all get out and, and we try different beers, um, but, I think we should have expression sessions with industry or experts. And this is kind of meeting that experience kind of challenge. Um, Sandra, I'm getting to that. Um, you know, so expression sessions with industry or experts, you know, so we'll invite an accessibility expert to come in and tell us about, you know, planning for accessibility. <laughs> You'd think so, not so much. Um, in conversation with, you know, what one thing that's really important is we need lots and lots of assets that, that moat the voices of learning designers who are currently working in the field, you know, telling us what they do, how they do it, with who they do it, what tools they use, um, you know, to keep it really, really close to the practice of learning design. Um, and the final thing is um, one of the subjects is going to be offered as a kind of work integrated learning experience in that um, I, I see it more as a shark tank or dragon's den kind of thing. Um, so the idea will be uh, learning designers uh, get a brief, uh, they have to pitch their idea, then they have to go and develop their idea, and then, you know, the industry professionals will critique their idea, which I think would be a lot of fun. Um, and if we can tie that into some of UTS's requirements and things like that. Um, so this is what it's going to look like. I'm, I'm, I've got about seven minutes, so I'm going to be quick here. It's going to be small, eight three credit point subjects as opposed to normal six credit point subjects. No prerequisites for each subject. So you can drop in anywhere you like and pick it up and move through the course that way. Um, blended or possibly entirely online. It's going to be online at the moment, to be honest. Um, uh, it's going to be offered via a monthly calendar, so you'll only do one subject per month. You'll quickly, you'll finish it, and you'll move on to the next subject. Um, and each subject will be offered as a short course, as a micro-credential, and as part of the award course. The only subject that won't be offered as a micro-credential is the work integrated learning one. It will be based entirely on open educational resources, um, mostly because people enrolled in short courses at our university don't get access to our university library. <laughs> so that's a design consideration. It's not a bug, it's a feature, right? <laughs> um, and the assessment will be by portfolio. 
Australia um, with the work integrated learning component. Um, and these are the kind of subjects that we're looking at. Um, so I think there's there's uh, 16 subjects there. Um, and, and the ones on the left are the ones that we kind of, uh, I'm just gonna jump right ahead to yeah, this second slide here. Um, so these were the eight subjects that everyone kind of agreed on. Uh, so think, learning theories and implications for learning design, design, designing for learning, critique issues in learning design, analyze, evaluation and assessment in learning design, crunch, learning analytics for performance improvement, uh, predict current and future trends in e-learning, create, creative, creating interactive multimedia objects and work integrated learning project. I wanted the change management in there, Colin. Um, you'll see it was on the list. It didn't make the cut for the first eight subjects. But the idea, the potential here, is that once students finish the grad cert, they might even be able to move up into a Master's of Learning Design, a Master's of Professional Practice, a Master's of Educational App Development, Master's of Educational Leadership and Learning. Uh, analyze, Evaluation and Assessment is in there. There's a subject called Analyze. Um, yeah, so, and, and these are the silos. Uh, that's what we call them, of course, Intended Learning Outcomes. Um, Remember, these are drafts, okay? Um, the, the biggest challenge I'm gonna be faced with is um, kinda, kinda fitting everything in. You know, we're looking at between 20 and 30 hours per subject. Uh, it's gonna be tough. <laughs> but yeah, um, Colin, I agree entirely. You know, we, we all know that as learning designers, we often wear lats and some of those are, um, you know, project manager, change manager, those kinds of things. Now, I reckon I've got about four minutes left to talk. Um, you know, so so please, I, I'm happy for you to actually um, with these. Yeah, tell me tell me what you mean by that, Colin, about sharing it uh, maybe a bit later. But yeah, please, questions, go. Also, that was just a response to someone asking about the slides. Um, oh, if you're okay, we can include the slides in the place where we share all of our. Um, recordings and everything. I, I'm, I'm certainly open to that, but I just want to get through the, the course accreditation committee um, meeting. Yeah, sorry. Of yeah, so that. after that, absolutely. Yep. Um, given, given the time we've got left, I'm wondering if we want to think about a way that we can also continue this discussion, uh, maybe on the Televisor's website as well, because I think there's a lot of, a lot of contributions people um, are happy to make. I mean, it could just be a discussion thread. Uh, you can have a shared document if you've got any thoughts on that. Um, but then I'll get yeah, I'll throw back to other questions for what people want to share now. Yes, please, absolutely. I I, I think you know we always make things much better um, when we we do it together. And uh, yeah, any contributions people can make would be brilliant. If anyone wants to. Um, um, Share your thoughts. Yeah, I've got. I've, hi, this is um, Deb McCormick from Monash Uni. Um, hi, Colin. <laughs> uh, just regarding the the content, of, I think it's really great that you're doing this, and uh, it's useful to have some kind of an accreditation for what it is that we do. Um, just seconding what Colin said though about the change management, I, I think that. The content that you're proposing um, is really great, but it seems very heavy on resource development. And for me, a, a lot of really don't think of being an instructional designer. For me um, personally, a really big part of being an ed designer, we're called educational designers at Monash, a really big part for me is the change management. <clears throat> it's a huge part of what we do. And it's about using our expertise in best practice pedagogy to um, change people's behaviour. And we do much more of that than resource development because we're, we're not set up as a, a resource development team. We, we work in, a, in the largest faculty and we have a very small team. So to do things at scale, we have to, um, we rely a lot more on the principles of change management than we do on actually creating resources. Hmm. Yeah, okay. No, thank you, Deb. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'd be interested to know, um, you know, what, what do you mean by, well, you know, what, what do you do when you say you, you uh, manage change? You know, is, is that uh, the kind of PD that you offer for staff? Is it, is it that kind of side-by-side -side planning kind of thing? You know, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm all of the, we might not have this conversation now. 
Yeah, yeah, all of the above. And also um, we tend to teach a person to fish rather than catch the fish for them. Yeah. So we might show them how to use a tool to create something themselves, but we don't create resources for people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, thank you for that feedback. And, and yeah, I, I take your point, yeah. No worries. Other questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I know, I'll just say one last thing. I noticed a lot of people mentioned at the start, um, you know, we need to be clear about the differences between learning designers, instructional designers, um, curriculum designers, educational designers, <laughs> which, uh, and, and I, I've actually been speaking to some of my colleagues overseas and they, they've started using the term learning engineers. Um, no. I quite like, but no. I, I just don't know if that's appropriate. No. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a changing space um, and, and, you know, 50 years ago when we started talking about instructional design is very different to what we mean when we talk about instructional design now. So, yeah, it's, it's complex. <laughs> oh, no one likes the learning engineer. Okay, I, I get that. I hear you loud and clear. All right, um, my Twitter, uh, hang on, I'll just show you my Twitter if someone asked for that. That's me, at Keith Heggett. Um, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, and, yeah, Colin, I'll, I'll try to get something going on the, the Moodle discussion page. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Keith. Like a good teacher, you've kept exactly the time. Uh, I get people to, yeah, we'll certainly absolutely look for ways to continue this conversation. There's a lot of stuff that we love talking about in this group. Um, so, yeah, you're going to have more trouble getting people to stop than to start. So, yeah, people are showing their appreciation and I'd yeah, definitely like to um, echo that. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. This has been a really fantastic session.